It's the most humbling role I have ever taken on in my life, bar none. I've never been so bad at anything. (laughs) I've never been so naturally bad at anything, but also great in some other ways. But in the end, I love my kids, they're great people, and I think we're setting them up for success. Shan Boudram has built a successful career as a sexologist who studies the nature of sex and relationships. She shares her research and personal insights through writing, TV appearances, and on her podcast and YouTube channel. And it's pretty radically honest. Shan and I met as models on the set of a photo shoot for underwear. Yes, I was briefly an underwear model. When she entered the room, all hair and smiles and beauty, I immediately understood why this brand wanted to work with her. And as I learned more about her work, my fascination only grew. Shan's followers have watched her life grow over the years to include her husband, Jared, and most recently, their two daughters, Ryu and Zaya. And her work has evolved with her family life as she unpacks parenting, sex, and intimacy in her content. What's up, lovers and friends? As the title suggests, we're going over seven different kinds of orgasms today. We got joined by my ultimate lover and my best friend. So for those of you who have followed me for a while, you might recall that I was hot as fuck in my first pregnancy. I'm Ashley C. Ford, and this is Going Through It a show about important moments in people's lives and how they navigate them. This season, we're asking how people decide whether or not to become parents. In this episode, I'm talking to Shan Boudrim about maintaining your sexuality through pregnancy and motherhood and the ongoing journey of becoming a parent from one kid to two. Since you've had your daughters, do you feel like you've been able to blend your sexual identity with motherhood in the way you wanted? The experience of Ryu and Zaya was so different. They're very different kids. With Ryu, I had the energy to try to fight back. I had the energy to, after I was pregnant, get back in the gym and work out and feel good in my body, feel energized in what I was doing, feel like I was getting the balance of self-care. When you have one kid, you have the trade-off time. When one parent is parenting, the other parent is doing whatever they want to do. And you don't really realize how much of that you lose. In my second pregnancy, I gave up on myself sexually. Like the amount of energy I had, I couldn't do anything. So I completely lost myself sexually. I was like, I don't even give a fuck. I literally told Jared, I'm like, (laughs) go get a friends with benefits. Because not only am I not interested, I don't even want you to look at me like that. I don't want to feel that pressure because I already felt from my kid, Ryu, that pressure of like, Mommy, why aren't you playing with me? I already could feel the eyes of, why aren't you? I don't want to feel that from you, Jared. Like, I can't, I don't have the capacity for it. Now that my second daughter is six months old, getting a little older, and those things are now starting to become more accessible to me. I think I had the arrogance. I think a lot of us can have the arrogance before we have kids of, I'm not going to be that kind of mom. And I definitely had that, well, I'm not going to have that story and that kind of screwed me over the second time around because when I had it before, the ability to fight against the trope or the stereotype I didn't want to be a part of, and I didn't have it again, it made me idolize myself in a way that was like, oh, well, the old you was better. The old you could do it. I'm not the old me anymore, but I don't feel as bad about that anymore. Sometimes I am that stereotypical, hasn't washed her hair, smells like spit up, would never even dream of having sex, let alone talk about it or think of myself in that context. Then there's also days where I'm like, oh my gosh, like somebody should film me and sell it because I'm hot as fuck. It's really hard for me sometimes with you, Shan. I got to be honest because I'm looking at you and I'm like, what's a bad day on Shan's face? That's nice. I love to hear that. (laughs) I can't imagine it. (laughs) We'll bring Jared back. He will describe it in great detail. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's fair. You know, I would actually love to know how you guys originally got together. I came to L.A. from Toronto in 2014. Typical story with just my car, stayed in a friend's couch for a few weeks, tried to figure it out. I ended up meeting someone there that six months later, seven months later, invited me out to a party. And I went 
And the person throwing that party was my now husband. A year later, I was in school for sexology. So I was like, I really want to just have great sex with somebody. I was learning a lot and wanting to experience it with somebody. So I definitely wasn't looking for anything substantial. I was just looking for a physical partner. And we just enjoyed each other that way. And I remember maybe two months later, I was going away and I was like, I need someone to water my plants. My fuck buddy lives close. Let me ask him if he'll do it. Got back, my plants were alive. And I was like, cool, I can rely on you for that. Then he asked me to come hang out with his friends. And I was like, this is weird. But I went and hung out with his friends and that was cool. And that's basically how our relationship built. It was just like one small brick of intimacy at a time until next thing I knew we were living together. (laughs) I really kid you not, that's how it happened. I looked up and I'm like, oh shit, we live together. What should we call this? (laughs) Then we continued on that got engaged. And that's really everything. Like nothing was predetermined, even having kids. I don't even know if we ever officially had a conversation. I know internally I didn't want kids, but I don't remember entering into the relationship with him and being clear about that or really knowing what his stance was. You've been very open about how you had to warm up to the idea of having children, that it didn't always feel like the most natural next step for you in your relationship. How did that shift happen? In essence, it was just a dismantling of a lot of the things that I thought a mother had to be or having children had to be like. The main reason I didn't want kids is because I don't like kids. And I use that very comfortably. Like, it's not really changed. I don't like very small kids. And I never had that baby thing, baby fever, that like aching ovaries. And I also grew up with a mom whom my mom had kids to be loved. Mm. I feel very comfortable saying that. You know, she came from a very broken home and she was the odd child out where, you know, her mom remarried and had kids with that person. And so she was the one who didn't really quite fit. She never knew her dad. So she always just kind of felt like she didn't really belong anywhere. And she really had kids to have someone, something to choose her first. And that put a lot of pressure on her children and me in particular and really treated me like that. Like this kid is made to love me. So we got a complicated relationship as I got older and I maybe didn't love her the way that she wanted because I was discovering how I wanted to love or who I was. And I read a book that was called The Art of Loving by Eric Fromm. And it said, there are two kinds of mothers. There are mothers who have kids to experience the love of a child. And there are mothers who have kids because they want to love an adult. And that little sentence unlocked so much in me. If you can love children and enjoy being loved by children, in a way that is not to feed yourself, but to nourish them. I think you give them the space to be what they're supposed to become. Right. How was it being pregnant the first time, being pregnant with Ryu? We were trying to conceive for six months. It's not a long amount of time. It was a good thing for me, though, because as somebody who didn't want kids before, every month that my period came after we really were trying was an opportunity for me to examine if I really wanted it or if it was just a thing that I thought would be cool to try. And so by the time I got to the fifth miss period, on the sixth one, when I saw that pregnancy test is positive, like it really was like, this is genuinely my next greatest adventure. And so pregnancy was rough, but I had that why. And I knew that I picked this wholeheartedly which is not something I had with the second, which made it a very, very different experience. That's so funny that you say that because my next question was really about the fact that, you know, I, as a viewer, I thought you were the one and done couple. Yes, me too. <laughs> like I remember seeing a video of you on a trip with Ryu and I thought that you were like, this is it, our family's complete. Can you talk to me about how you found out you were pregnant with your second daughter, Zaya? I found out the best way possible, come to find out. But to your point, Ashley, we were one and done. We never wanted to have a life that was about kids. So one was his clear answer. It wasn't as clear for me. I definitely, as someone who didn't want to have kids, agreed with all of his sentiments. But my sister is like somebody I am creepily obsessed with. She's such a huge influence in my life. I just, I could cry at any given moment talking about the love I have for my sister and how lovely the experience of having a sister is. So I was always kind of torn, like, yeah, but how could I deny someone the opportunity that I have? So I was always kind of 50-50, but prior to getting pregnant, I said to myself, I'm not putting in my IUD, my birth control, because I just want to give my body a break. And I always say, as a sex educator, I know how sex works. So whether I want to admit this or not, by not using protection, I was 
obviously inviting the experience of a second baby in my life, even though it wasn't something I was verbalizing. So I told myself before I went away on this particular trip, when I come back from this trip, which Jared is not on, I was away from him for a month, I'm going to put my IUD back in. Turns out I got pregnant the day that I left for that trip. So when I got back, that's when I found out. So the good thing about it, though, is that, again, I wasn't trying to conceive. So I felt sick. And I'm like, why do I feel sick? Like, this is so weird. And Jared's like, are you pregnant? I was like, no. I'm still breastfeeding. My period was like not regular. We didn't have sex. I didn't see him for three weeks. There's no way I'm pregnant. And he's like, just get a pregnancy test just in case. So got a test, peed on the stick, put it on the counter, got in the shower. I'm with my kid. And I'm like, oh, yeah, let me check that stick. So I clear the shower door off. And I look. And it's one line. And I was like, oh. And then I'm like, what? What's that feeling? What's that feeling? Disappointment? Like, this is great news. And I told Jared, he was like, this is great news. And I'm like, yeah, this is good news. I'm not pregnant. You know, we don't want another kid. Fast forward to three days. I'm still feeling awful. And I'm like, let me take one more pregnancy test. And it comes back positive. And I'm so glad that I had that other moment because I feel like that was the revelation of how I truly felt because the next nine months really tested everything I had in me. I felt like I ruined my life. Wow. I really did. Okay, so what was that like? So I actually on my podcast was very clear with people, don't want this baby, didn't pick this life, feel miserable as fuck, right. have no motivation, and very unhappy do not want to have sex with my husband. Don't know if I ever will again, but everything has duality to it. That was something that this experience taught me is like, man, I really don't give up. I can have moments of giving in to the feeling mm -hmm. and surrendering, but I'm going to try the next day. I appreciated that, you know, looking back on this pregnancy because one of the things I talked about was it really redefined self-love for me because I always thought of self-love as this collection of the best parts of you. You know, self-love is reminding yourself you are resilient and cool and you have high energy and you're smart and you're passionate and you're funny and you're charismatic and you're caring. But what if you don't have access to those things because you're just too fucking tired? So it helped me to really redefine that from self-love as highlighting and embracing the best parts of you to just embracing yourself regardless of where you're at. We'll be right back. Something I'm always worried about is not being able to give a child enough of myself. How do you navigate those feelings? I think that there are definite times where I have access to give more than what I have in my tank. And there are times where I don't. And I think my general scorecard is pretty good. It's so much easier for me to be a good parent now than it was this time last year, just because I feel good. And I will say that like your own individual health is just 80% of the battle. I woke up every day and felt sick for nine months, 10 months, but I was not that parent to my kid. I had so many times where I would just cry, but I also know what it feels like to feel so guilty and ashamed and shitty, but also to know that you don't have the option to do better right now. And those moments happen and they're okay and your kids survive. And if you can apologize to your kids, you know, I'm very comfortable apologizing to my kids, even now before comprehension, because I'm not gonna promise to get it right, but I do promise to let you know that I acknowledge I was wrong. How do you think about talking to them one day about your life online? I hope it's a place of deep pride and joy. Like I have found my it, my why, my purpose in the world. I'm really passionate about it. I've developed an amazing community because of it. Like this is why I had you guys. I had you because I figured this really big part of life out and not just this, like the love part. And I want to set them up to get that feeling too in their own way. I was very influenced by Will Smith's analogy of parenting is not a sculptor to clay. It is a gardener to a seed. Mm. And so I don't know what these seeds are yet. I have no idea if they're going to be mustard trees or they're going to be pomegranate trees. As I started this analogy, I realized I don't know much about trees, so I have nowhere else to go. <laughs> Fig trees. You know, I don't know what they're going to become, but 
I know it's my job to provide an environment that's rich for them to reach whatever their potential is. And so I hope they look at their mom like, oh, she got to the right soil, right? It was a weird soil. Yes. And she grew into something that was unlike the other plants in the garden. But yeah, it worked for her. Hopefully it worked for them. I don't know. Maybe they'll grow to dislike it. But even if they don't personally like it, they're like, my mom's job is weird. She's super weird. She's really out there. She says a lot. She does way too much. I would never do half of what she does. But she really likes it. And I love what it's done for her. Let me find that thing that will do it for me. Mm, I love that. Let me ask, because your mom wanted to be a mom, do you feel like she found that thing for her? And that's why you've been able to find the thing for you? No. My mom, when she was 17, had one of her ovaries removed, and the doctors told her that the other one didn't work. Of course, we know she goes on to have four. But she didn't think she could have children at all. And I think my mom, once she was told that she could not have children, romanticized the idea of being a mother. She wanted someone to love her the way she loved her mother. But I don't think my mom really wanted to parent. You know, there's there's anger, there's regret, there's frustration. There are all those things that might come into a relationship that you have with your child, as far as I know. But with my mom, there was a, also a paralysis. Um, she would be so afraid for us, so afraid for us, that it almost made her mad at us, that she was preoccupied emotionally and mentally by us all the time. And I, unfortunately, tend to have the feeling or the the worry that because I was not raised in a home that was particularly loving toward children, that that is actually my natural state. And all of the joy that I have around children now, all of the love that I have for them, I'm worried that the second I feel frustration or the second I feel anger, I am no longer me. What you shared was so beautiful. And I'm just very cautious of not giving people parenting advice when they didn't ask a question. They just shared what they experienced. I want to hear everything you have to tell me. I just want to say in reflection to what you just said, something that I learned with Ryu is a very big personality, very strong-willed. She's so strong-willed that, like, disciplining her is very hard. And so for a long time, I gave her lots of choice and lots of autonomy. And then I saw, because I didn't want to be mean to her, because I have to either get aggressive with her or let her have her way. Mm -hmm. And I was often, like, letting her have her way when it came to going to bed or what she ate and how she behaved. And I realized when she started to socialize that not being more firm with her was causing more issues for her. Because when you don't eat well, you get sick more. So you've got to be more aggressive about that. And when you're not sleeping well, you're a lot more cranky throughout the day and you're harder to deal with and people aren't as nice to you. And so a lot of the ways that I thought I don't want to inhibit you, and a big thing for me is I didn't want to domesticate my kids. Like I didn't want to expect a child to behave like an adult. So I really had to strike that balance of letting her go free and figure it out and be a kid, but also acknowledging that if she didn't take up some of the adulthood responsibilities, there were repercussions for that too that would impact her life in other ways. Maybe not directly by me because I was giving her the freedom. I was being cool, but her experience wouldn't be as great. So that to be said, it's all push and pull. There is no like linear thing of, oh, being a good parent is never or always. It's like such a gray mismatch and I'm growing up with my kids and I'm still figuring it out. If I ever for a second tried to assume that we're all having the same experience in terms of not just decision-making about parenthood, but also about what happens once you make that decision, it's obliterated. Everybody has had different experiences. Everybody has come to different conclusions about parenthood. And really, in my opinion, the one thing that everybody can agree on is like, at the end of the day, these people need to be taken care of. Yeah. And you're just gonna have to figure it out if you do it. It's the most humbling role I have ever taken on in my life, bar none. 
I've never been so bad at anything. <laughs> I've never been so naturally bad at anything, but also great in some other ways. Yeah, it's it's such a wild, humbling ride. But in the end, I love my kids. They're great people. And I think we're setting them up for success. And I hold on to that when everything else is water. And everything else is water. Shan's confessions about the challenges of motherhood are so helpful to hear. She bounced back after both of her pregnancies, but she's still honest about the ways the process was imperfect. I think it can be easy to want to tie our stories up neatly in a box, but there's so much more to learn when we just let them be messy and human. As I think about whether or not I want to pursue parenthood, I'm holding on to something Shan said. It's all push and pull. Nothing is purely linear. And sometimes the hardest part is learning how to sit in that gray area where we don't have it all figured out and we are trying our best to just be. Going Through It is a production of Pineapple Street Studios and MailChimp. Our producer is Emerald O'Brien. Our associate producers are Marina Hankey and Yinka Rickford Anguin. Our managing producer is Camila Kashani. The show is edited by Aaron Edwards. Mixing by Davy Sumner. Original music by Mike Noyce and Davy Sumner with additional music from Epidemic Sound. Mara Davis is our booker. We had help from Stephen Key, Jason Richards, and Ari Saperstein. Legal services for Pineapple Street by Bianca Grimshaw at Granderson de Roche. Our executive producer is J.N. Berry. Our production partners at MailChimp Studios are Julie Douglas, Sasha Brown, Christina Humphrey, and Caroline Albro. And a special thanks to my better half, without whom none of this would be possible. My assistant, Ariane Young. And thank you for listening. We know the range of experiences around this decision is so broad. And while we can't cover every story, we're grateful that we could bring you a few of them. 